today we're installing Proxmox and correctly adding cloud hosted routers to our node. I got my hardware and I got my Proxmox USB drive ready to go. I just need to boot from it and I can begin the installation. The setup is pretty simple. Agree to sacrifice your firstborn child and choose the correct disk drive if you have multiple. Specify the country and choose a password. Then we get to the network configuration. First, you need to choose your host name, but it has to be in FQDN format, so the domain name is mandatory. For personal use, we can just type .local at the end. Next, there is no option to use DHCP for addressing, which makes sense. I actually do have a DHCP server running, which I will use for my VMs, so I will assign an IP address that is from the same network but was not included in the DHCP address pool. If you are adamant about your server getting an IP through DHCP, you can keep the default IPs for now. Proceed with the installation and once it is complete, you will be greeted with a login screen. If you have set up the static addressing correctly, you can log into the web GUI from an another device. If you are opting for the DHCP setup, you need to do one additional step. Log into the router as the root user with the password that you set up and edit the following file slash etc slash network slash interfaces. There you need to find the iFace VMBR0 and change the word static to DHCP and also delete the next two lines for static address and gateway. Save the file. You will still have the same static IP at that point, so you need to also execute systemctl restart networking.service. That should get you an IP through DHCP that you can now use to access the web interface. On your browser, type the IP address of your Proxmox followed by a column and the port number 8006. You might also need to add HTTPS before the IP. The browser will probably give you a warning since the Proxmox will have a self-signed TLS certificate. So just accept the risk and continue. The login credentials are user root and the password you set up. By the way, the Proxmox login is using the names and passwords of your Linux users, but the permissions are set individually, so you could just create another Linux user, give it permissions from the GUI, and then use that for login. If you look at the data center storage, you can already see there are two storage locations created, local and local-LVM. By default, if we now create new virtual machines, they will be stored inside the local LVM, which is the logical volume with some benefits, but it does not support the QCOW2 file format. For those of you who don't know, you can create very large QCOW2 disk images, but they will take up very little disk space until you actually fill them with data. So that is very efficient and it provides a lot of flexibility in regards to your storage requirements. So if you are planning on using the QCOW2 file format for CHR and other VMs, you will need to either add disk image content type to the local storage and store them there, or you will need to add a new storage location to your liking. In this case, I will use the raw disk image file format that I will download from the Microtech public web server. The internet access for my node is working, so I can now add CHR. First click on the create VM, specify a name if you want, and click next. On the OS tab, select do not use any media, and leave the guest OS version on the 5.x option, as that will include the routerized kernel. On the system tab, you don't need to do anything, and on the disks tab, you want to delete the disk that is created by default. Then we can just give CHR some CPU cores and one gigabit of RAM should be enough. Now we can go to the shell section of our node and use wget to download RouterOS. The download location has been following a certain predictable pattern for quite a while, so you should be able to modify the version number in two spots in the link that I have typed and download the exact version that you would like. In my case, I am downloading the current latest CHR version 7.8 from the 7.8 section. 
I would suggest using the latest one listed on our website or forum. So when you are watching this, you might need to replace the 7.8 with 7.9 or maybe 7.25, you get the idea. Next, I need to unzip the image. So I will install unzip. First, I need to do apt update and then we can install. After the unzip, I can remove the zip file and then I will also use the Quemu image resize command to give the disk a little more storage space. With that done, I can now add the disk to my VM with the following command, QM disk import, followed by the identification number of your newly created VM. By default, this is 100 for your first VM, followed by the name of the CHR disk file and the storage location that will be used. I pick the default local LVM, as in this case, I'm using raw disk image format instead of QCOW2. Now, when I go to the VM's hardware, there is a new unused disk. Click on it and then click add. Then go to the options and change the boot order so that we boot from the correct image. If you forget to do this and you start a VM without a disk it can boot from, Proxmox will go into some weird boot loop where you can't stop it from trying to start this one VM unless you reboot the entire node. So make sure you got this step right. Then we could add more network interfaces as by default there is only one. At this point, if we try to add one, there is only one bridge network available and it doesn't make sense to have all your ports bridged together outside of your router. So click on the node and go to system network where you can create new networks. I will just add a few bridge networks that I can use as individual connections between my CHR and other VMs. Then I can add a couple more NICs to my CHR with different bridge networks. At this point, the CHR is ready, but I would advise against starting it now if you are planning on creating multiple CHRs. You can clone your CHR later, but that will cause a systemic interface naming issue. When cloning a VM, Proxmox correctly assigns new MAC addresses to all your interfaces. But other than that, it will be an exact copy. This means that if you have already done the first startup on the initial CHR, it will have taken the initial MAC addresses of any interfaces that it might have had and reserved interface names for them, starting with Ether1 and counting up, Ether2, Ether3 and so on. But now when the router sees freshly generated interface MACs, there will be no way for it to recognize that those are the replacements for the initial interfaces and it will name them as if they are additional interfaces to the ones it had originally. In other words, the naming will not start from Ether1. To address this, I suggest you turn this first router into a template first and now we can clone it as many times as we want. Before we can start our clone CHRs, we do need to do one more thing. The bridge networks we created do not exist in this runtime. Through GUI, we only added the configuration, so we need to reboot and the system will add them properly. Once that is done, we can start our CHRs. If I go to the console of the first one, it is a first time startup. It has received an IP through DHCP, the interfaces are named correctly and I can already see my gateway and the other CHR in the neighbors. But it doesn't have an IPv4 yet. Look at the other one. Again, it's the first startup after which we can see that the interfaces are named correctly and in the IP neighbors we see the other CHR with its IP. To further break down the wiring here, the Ether1 of both routers is connected to the default bridge network, which is bridged to my gateway that handed out the IPs. And then Ether2 and Ether3 are like two isolated connections between the two routers. Obviously, you would need to play around with the VM NIC configurations and the node network configuration to get the topology that you are looking for. I hope this made sense to you and you will now be using CHR in your Proxmox setups. Take care.